seven fifty four. It's um, like way. Hmm. I'm trying. Is it? Isn't? And my watch says uh, one minute, so eleven fifty nine. That's weird. My computer is slow. <laughs> nice. So I'm not sure if we're live on Facebook yet. I'm checking you. Yep, we are live on YouTube. Uh, working, we'll check Facebook. And hello to anybody who's just joining us. Our live stream set up here for this tank talk. Well, we'll be talking about producing healthy aquarium fish. Bear with us while we just double check all the streams are running properly. Healthy aquarium fish. Yeah. All right, so I got the chat for Facebook, chat for YouTube. So, all right, I think we can go ahead and get started. We're a little bit early, um, but uh, welcome everybody to our regular reoccurring series every other week. Um, we're called Tank Talk. So this week we are covering producing healthy aquarium fish. We have Dr. Nick, our resident certified aquatic veterinarian, who brings just a ton of experience to the live query team. So thank you, Dr. Nick, uh, for taking the time to not only put this information together, but uh, you know, joining the live stream. Thanks, Ian. Um, so uh, just as a yeah. quick, yeah, go ahead. Go, no, you go. I was just gonna say as a quick reminder, everybody, this is a, a, li a, new, a new series we do every other week. Uh, we call it Tank Talk, and we're just really trying to take a lot of the questions we've gotten over the years and weeks and condense them into presentations and to information that you, the hobbyist, can digest and learn from and uh, you know, obviously have a better aquarium keeping experience. So as I said, this week's um, topic is producing healthy aquarium fish, and I'm actually quite excited to hear what Dr. Nick has to say about this one. So um, yeah, I think without further ado, hopefully everybody actually can hear us in case anybody like we got five people on Facebook, have some people on YouTube. So hopefully, hopefully we're coming through loud and clear. I did check audio before we started, but you know, it is live. So, all right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Dr. Nick, I'll let you uh, take control and um, guide us through this presentation. All right, thanks, Ian. This is a little different talk for week three of our tank talks, and the topic is producing healthy aquarium fish. In the last two talks, we talked about feeding fish and then water quality, and those are so important, but a lot of people who are buying their fish at their uh, local aquarium store, and they say, well, gee, you know, I'm buying this fish at the store. Where does it really come from? And this is something that most people aren't, aren't even aware of. And so I thought this would be a great topic to tie in with everything we've, we've uh, talked about previously in why, uh, you know, what happens, how we keep the fish healthy, and what goes on behind the scenes. Okay, so let's start the first slide. So uh, I call this one the progression of the fish. You know, where do these fish come from? You know, you're getting them at your local fish store, but how did they get there? So here's an interesting fact. So the majority of aquarium fish, freshwater aquarium fish you're buying today, probably 90 to 95% of the aquarium fish, freshwater fish sold in pet stores are farm raised somewhere around the world. Uh, of those, about 60% of those are produced in Asia, and 40% of those are produced in Florida, if you're buying them from the U.S. If you're buying them from other countries, that is probably not so much. But in the, in the United States, about 40% of the aquarium fish come from Florida, where there's multiple fish farms in Florida. Uh, and then the rest are imported from Asia and a few from other countries. For the wild-caught fish, there are probably five to 10% of the fish you actually buy are still wild collected. And they're coming from South America, Central America, Africa, and a few places in India and Asia. Um, <clears throat> those fish that are uh, uh, wild collected go through a similar process. They're coming from a collector that then goes to an exporter. If they're coming from a fish farm, they're coming from a fish farm to an exporter to be shipped into the United States or Europe, if you're in Europe or wherever they're going. So once they get shipped there, there's an importer who is getting those fish. Now that importer might be just importing the fish, you go through the government inspections. Uh, in the United States, the fish come through a USDA inspection, and then they may go to a wholesaler. In some cases, the importer is also the wholesaler, so they may then be selling directly to the pet store, 
or the importer may sell only to another wholesaler. That wholesaler may sell then directly to a pet store, or they might sell to a local distributor who the local pet stores will physically go to that location and pick up fish for their store. Um, then that distributor will sell to a pet store who then sells it to you to put into your aquarium. So if you count the number of places, there's as many as seven steps in this process. And every one of those steps, the fish are being put in an aquarium and then they're put in a bag, they're shipped to somewhere else, they're put into an aquarium, then they'll be put into a bag, shipped somewhere else. And so that's a lot of stress on those fish. And it's important that every step keeps good water quality, feeds them good food, and then gives them the proper environment and, and looks for diseases and treats diseases. Because the fish, whether they're coming from a wild or coming from a farm, they're probably raised in ponds. And in the ponds, there's likely to be some parasites that the fish get. And those parasites need to be treated along the way. So that's actually a lot of steps. Uh, this is an example, and I, I like to put this in. Uh, uh, it's, this was a trip I took to Rio Negro in Brazil, which is a tributary to the Amazon. And this is where a lot of discus, angelfish, cardinal tetras, other uh, aquarium fish, a lot of cichlids, are still collected. And these are collected in a very sustainable fashion. And these piaberos, which means uh, fishermen for little fishes in Portuguese, and that's what these guys are called in, uh, guys and girls are called in Brazil, that collect these fish, uh, piaberos. And they catch these fish with hand nets and put them into wicker baskets with plastic liners and then take them by canoe to the uh, collect collection station, which will then be the exporter that sends them on. But the neat thing about this is this business of collecting wild fish supports whole communities of fishermen, and, and this is their sole income. And if it wasn't for collecting these fish, they would have to go to uh, logging, cut down forests, farming, which cuts down forests, and cattle ranching, which cuts down forests. The nice thing about fish collecting is when the floods come, the rains come, the rivers flood. And if you look in this picture, you can see this forest. This forest is actually flooded. And this is the rainy season. The water is very shallow on these forests, maybe two or three feet deep. And they go in there with their canoes and they catch the fish in this forest after the fish have been through their breeding season and there's huge populations of fish, millions and millions of fish. And they're only catching small quantities of those fish. What happens is after the rainy season is over, the fish, the, the rains recede, the waters recede, the forest becomes dry again. The fish are concentrated into the small rivers or big river, but they're concentrated into the rivers. And there's an overpopulation of fish now. And a lot of those fish get eaten or die. And so by collecting them during the flood season, you're collecting when there's the greatest population of fish, the fish are very plentiful. And uh, then when, they, when the waters recede, a lot of those fish are dying anyway, waiting until the next spawning season. And uh, so it's a very sustainable. They've been doing this for 70 years and there's still plenty of fish in these locations. So one of the things we do want to continue supporting is these um, uh, wild collection processes that are sustainable and supporting populations of people that are doing it. Okay, so uh, the next stop is Florida. <laughs> going from South America to Florida. These are some fish farms in Florida. Now, Florida is primarily where uh, tropical fish are, formed, are, are farmed in the United States because of the warm weather and plenty of water. There's also farming in other Southern states and goldfish farming is predominantly in um, Arkansas and other uh, states around the US, uh, but there's a lot of goldfish that are raised here. It, traditionally, in Florida, you would dig a hole in the dirt, it would fill with water, you throw your fish in there, the fish breed, you catch the fish, and there you go. Uh, what they're finding is that uh, the water tables are dropping, and um, so that a lot of the farmers are using liners to maintain the water level. So this middle picture, you'll see there's a plastic liner that's holding the pond, and you can just kind of see some red fish in there, probably some red platies or something like that in that pond. Uh, and then the other thing that traditionally these dirt ponds, they'd be snakes, frogs, birds, lots and lots of things that get in there and eat the fish. 
And so now they're starting to cover the ponds. And both of the two end pictures, you'll see there's a, one is a dirt pond, but has a, a flat liner over it. And the other are those plastic lined ponds, but there's a little framed uh, uh, housing over it. And they found that after they put these netting on, they're raising um, 50% to 100% more fish. Mm. So that means that's how many fish were being eaten by predators in these open ponds. Uh, maybe half your population of fish were being eaten. And so by covering the ponds, they're increasing the production. Now there's a large cost to putting the liner in the pond and putting the, sh the shade cloth and the, and the protection uh, over the pond. So you have to offset, I'm gonna spend a lot of money to cover these ponds. I need a higher return on my fish to be able to afford that. And, and it's, it is working out. So what's the next step? Uh, going from these outdoor dirt ponds, which are uh, relatively inexpensive to build a pond, uh, just a dirt pond, and now you're going to go to uh, a, a, the, the bigger dirt ponds. And um, oh, so, so this is just an example of collecting fish from the pond. So how do they catch the fish? So some of those ponds were pretty small, but a lot of the old traditional ponds, especially for like goldfish, are very, very large ponds. Uh, it may be up to a half an acre or an acre or even two acres. So the way they collect the fish is they'll drain the water level down to maybe two feet deep, and then they'll actually walk through the, the pond with a seine, bringing all the fish to one area, and then they'll use buckets to bucket the fish out put them into uh, holding vats in, in trucks to truck them over into uh, the export facility. So this is just an uh, example. This is hard work, yeah. uh, pulling these seines through the water and collecting these fish. So the alternative I was going to go to is this is sort of the new modern technique is indoor intensive culture. Intensive means you're monitoring every facet. So those outdoor ponds and those all around the world that will have those, you know, I've been to Malaysia and Singapore, Thailand, Sri Lanka, um, Hong Kong, all these places where they're raising fish in ponds, they're just essentially dirt ponds or cement ponds outdoors. They don't take a lot of expense, but they do take a lot of labor. So here we're now moving fish indoors. And you can see some of these vats here, um, they can have as many fish in this vat as you would have in an outdoor pond. So the concentration of fish is much greater. And the reason for that is these ponds, uh, these vats are aerated and they have water that's filtered. So we call it recirculating aquaculture system. And these recirculating aquaculture systems, which are primarily we use a lot in, in the food industry for fish food, fish for food, uh, they use, um, recirculating filtration that keeps the water clean. And so there's a lot of energy, electricity, equipment, pumps, uh, maybe even water heaters, things like that. But the advantage is you can take a much smaller space and produce larger quantities of fish. And so in places like Florida, where everybody wants to move to Florida, property prices are soaring. You can sell your fish farm for a lot more dollars for the land than the farm. Then you could you could build a small building with this in it and produce as many fish. So this is kind of the wave of the future. It does require energy, uh, but it's actually less labor. And as the labor costs get more expensive, this is less labor, but more equipment. So yeah, that's definitely, just a- uh, Definitely sounds more sustainable, more efficient, and even say some, some of the larger uh, dirt ponds that we looked at earlier too. As far as what and, you, and it, in in warm areas where you don't have to worry about heating this as much, you could do this anywhere in the world. Uh, heating costs in you know northern climates would be expensive, but otherwise this yeah. is uh, could be done anywhere. Okay, so those are the farms. So the farmer he's going to send the 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 fish usually by truck, and I've seen where they have this their bins of fish in the back of a pickup truck driving from the farm to the exporter. The exporter will then send it, so here in the United States, to an importer here. Um, so here's what happens at the importer. These are bags of fish that have been dumped into bins. The bins are covered. You can see they have uh, lids on them so the fish don't jump out. They're getting a water change. So what's happening is fresh water is going into that bin. 
Uh, the fish are being examined. If there's you know any unhealthy or dead fish, they'll be removed. The fish get fresh water. And then two things can happen. That fish might go back in a bag and be immediately shipped back out to the next station. Or if it's not going out immediately, then they'll put it into aquarium where it's going to sit until somebody orders that fish and it's ready to go, in which case it'll be netted and rebagged and shipped back out again. So from this position, from the uh, um, importer, it's going to go to a wholesaler. Now, most wholesale facilities, they're, you know, they're pretty plain, pretty basic. They're uh, sometimes big tanks, sometimes glass tanks, but there's just rows and rows of tanks. And every tank will get, uh, you know, one shipment of fish for um, one bag of fish will go into a tank and they'll label the date and where it came from and, and what it is. And then they're waiting for a customer to order it. And the customers say, hey, send me two dozen neon tetras. And so then they'll catch up those two dozen neon tetras, bag them up and ship them back again. Uh, it might be directly to the fish store or it might be to one more step, which is the um, a dis distribution facility. And this is a, a big distribution facility. You see there's, these are acrylic tanks. They're stacked one on top of the other like pyramids. And so there's access to both sides of these. And these tanks are just the fish come in, they get there, and then they get um, uh, treated. The nice thing about these places that hold the fish is they'll test the fish for parasites, they'll medicate them, uh, you know, for uh, uh, protozoa, bacteria, uh, skin flukes, gill flukes, all these different things that the fish can be carrying. As these fish get shipped and shipped, they get stressed. In the wild, or even in the original pond, these fish could have parasites, and they never have a problem. They're healthy. You know, you you tell the farmer, "Hey, your fish has parasites." And they say, "I have no problem with my fish. They're all healthy because they're not stressed." But once you start shipping them and stressing them, then those parasites become a problem. So, in each step in this process, you got to be watching for that and, and treating it, making sure the fish get healthy. So now the fish are ready to go, let's say, to the fish store. So here's a person, they've got a cart, they've got buckets, they've got a list of fish to collect. They're going to the different tanks, catching the certain number of fish of each variety or each species, putting it into a bucket. All of these buckets will be ready to go to one store. So after they're, they're packed up in the buckets, they go on to some kind of you know, conveyor belt system or tray where the fish are put into bags. The bags will go through and be filled with oxygen and then sealed. Now, if you're taking the fish home from the fish store to your house and you got it 30 minutes, maybe maybe an hour or two, that's not a problem. They'll just seal the bag with some oxy with some air in it. So it should be, you know, 50% air, 50% water, that would be fine going home from the fish store. But these fish might have a longer trip, 24 hours, 30 hours, 48 hours, and so they need more than just air. And these will be shipped with oxygen. And we mentioned in a previous talk, oxygen contains about 18,000 times, or I'm sorry, uh, air contains about 18,000 times more oxygen than the water does. So when you're putting pure oxygen in, that's five times even more than just air. So you get so much oxygen in that bag that it will diffuse into the water while these fish are in that bag, and they will not run out of, water, of oxygen in that water. There's plenty of oxygen in that bag. And unfortunately, sometimes fish get delayed because of uh, shipping delays, uh, truck breaks down, things like that. And I've seen fish that have been in bags for a week or more, and they're still fine as far as oxygen goes. Now, the water could be dirty. They haven't been eat, haven't eaten, so that's not good. But the oxygen is still plentiful. Uh, so when they go uh, in this um, conveyor line, they're putting oxygen in the bag. And that oxygen, uh, it shows here, these are bags of fish ready for shipping. You got some nice discus on the top, guppies on the bottom. And there should be 50% or maybe even 60% oxygen to just enough water to cover the fish because the fish aren't going to be moving around much. Uh, they're, they're going to be in a dark place and they're not going to be active. They're not going to be swimming around or eating. They're both basically going to be resting. And so they just need to make sure they have plenty of oxygen and maintain a constant temperature. So from here, they get put into a bag and uh, the bags get put into boxes. The bottom, you'll see the little white line. That's actually a styrofoam box. And there's either a styrofoam or metallic bubble liners, some 
form of insulated material that will help maintain the temperature. And there's also heat packs in the winter or even cool packs in the summer that will go into these boxes to help maintain temperature. So you see there's a couple bags of koi in this, uh, in the, this box. And those boxes will then get packed into cardboard. The cardboard will protect them. And it also actually has some insulation value. It gets put into the, the boxes. Those boxes get loaded primarily on trucks. So obviously they come by plane from Asia or South America to the United States. But once they're here, they mostly will travel by truck. And it could be a one day journey, maybe a two day journey. Most places you can get to within two days um, uh, in, in a truck. Uh, commercial trucking. And th so they'll get to there, they get to the fish store. The fish store now unpacks the box, puts them into their tank. And so now you're at the fish store or you're online, you're buying your fish, and they're in some kind of a display tank where, again, the local fish store operator is going to check the fish, make sure they're healthy, treat them, you know, formalin malachite green or quick cure or whatever treatment that it might need to keep them healthy and um, quarantine them, hopefully, and then put them out for sale. So now you finally can buy that fish and you put it into your home aquarium. So it could be a freshwater aquarium, marine aquarium. They go pretty much the same process. Uh, marine aquarium fish are still maybe 40 to 50% wild collected versus captive bred. Whereas salt, uh, freshwater fish are you know, by far to large, 90 plus percent captive bred. But captive bred marine fish is getting to be a really big thing. And we're seeing lots and lots of marine fish start to be uh, captive bred now. And so you'll, you'll have greater availability and healthier fish um, if they're farmed and shipped a shorter way from the, the breeder to the fish store. So finally, you got this bag of fish, you're bringing it home. What do you do to it? Don't put it in your aquarium. Okay, what do you do? <laughs> you got to quarantine those oh, fish. I mean, like we're missing all of us have, yeah, all of us have, have stuck fish into aquariums when we bought them, and hopefully everything's been okay. And with a good, reputable dealer, they will have tested the fish, treated them, and everything will be fine. But these fish have been through a lot of stress. Let's give them time to de-stress, to put them into a quiet area. So ideally, when you bring your fish home, you're going to put them into a quarantine tank. And this can be a 10-gallon aquarium, 20-gallon aquarium, bare tank, no gravel, uh, uh, minimal lighting, because dark is actually good for these fish. But you do want to keep a, a lid on it so the fish don't jump out. Uh, a fil filtration system could be as simple as a sponge filter or hang on the back filter, uh, in-tank filter like this one, an air stone. Uh, to oxygenate the water, a heater to keep it warm, keep it at the right temperature, and then just put the fish in there. Okay, so now you have this fish in this uh, quiet, calm tank that it can be all by itself for a little bit. So what do you do there? So now you want to provide a hiding place for the fish so it can it can relax and feel comfortable. It's not all stressed out. Uh, dim the lights so it's not bright. Uh, because the filter is probably not seeded, uh, it, even though you got this filter in there, it might not be uh, have, have a lot of bacteria that's breaking down the fish waste. So you do need to check your water quality on pretty much a daily basis, I would recommend, at least for the first week or so. And you can you can add you know bacteria starter if you want, things like that. Uh, but test the water, change it if you start seeing ammonia or nitrite building up or pH changes. Get the water quality right for whatever that fish is. Uh, use a heater to maintain the temperature and then feed that fish small amounts frequently. If you have an opportunity, feed it three or four times a day, small amounts. Generally, twice a day or three times a day is okay, but you want to give it some nutrition. It probably hasn't been fed much during this duration of shipping. They usually do get fed, but not the day that they get packed out. So they might have skipped meals several times during this trip. So you do want to give them some food, build their nutrition back up, get them eating again. Uh, if you notice any health issues, you want to start treating them. If they're healthy, just keep them in there for a period of time. Make sure you know you give them enough time that if, we're gonna, if they're going to break with ick or other disease, you'll see it. And uh, so how long? You know, two weeks to four weeks. Uh, some people will do preventive treatment with some of the uh, 
uh, ick medications or other type of things. So if you're medicating the tank and uh, the fish is doing fine for two weeks, you're probably going to be okay. If you're not medicating and the fish are fine after four weeks, you'll probably be fine. The word quarantine originally comes from the Latin quarant, which is 40, and the original quarantine was 40 days. Uh, so 40 days is great, but you probably don't need to do 40 days, but 30 is good, four weeks, two weeks, three weeks, fine. Uh, I would go at least two weeks, though. Um, and so now when you're ready to uh, take that fish out, if it's already in a tank that has the same water quality and the same temperature as your show aquarium or main aquarium, you can just catch the fish and move them over. Once you move them over, it's also good to turn down the lights and feed the fish uh, so that everybody is distracted by food and they won't worry about the new fish going in. Now, if you are unbagging the fish into the quarantine tank or into your other aquarium, you want to make sure the water temperature is the same. So you'll float the bag in your tank to get the water equal, the water temperature equal. Usually 15 minutes is good, unless the water was really cool because of transportation time from the fish store uh, might leave a little bit longer. So lower the lighting, uh, and then you want to make sure the water quality in your aquarium is good because We've talked before about how water quality changes over time and gradual changes won't hurt the fish that are in it in most cases. So let's say the pH is dropped and the fish in the tank are fine because they're accustomed to the low pH. But the fish from the fish store is at a higher pH. So you can check the water quality in the aquarium, make sure it's where you want it to be. And then when you open the fish bag, you can check the water quality in the fish bag to make sure that the two are fairly similar. When you're adding fish to your aquarium, you only want to add a few fish at a time because if you add a whole bunch of fish all at one time, that will increase the bio load rapidly and the beneficial bacteria in your biological filter isn't going to be able to accommodate that. You'll get an ammonia spike and maybe a nitrite spike, and that's not good. So add a few fish at a time and you won't have any problem with that. Okay, now you're ready to add the fish. So you open the bag. Some people will tell you, open the bag and let it float but don't. <laughs> if you open the bag, you're letting out that air and oxygen that was pressurized in the bag, and the fish will now start losing oxygen in the water. And so as they're consuming oxygen in the water, the water isn't going to get oxygen dissolved back into it. So once you open the bag, you want to take the fish out fairly soon. Okay, so don't do some kind of float with the fish in the bag, but the bag being open. Okay, now, uh, you so you open the bag, you check the water temperature, it's okay, the pH is okay. So at that point, you really want to get the fish out of the bag and put it in the aquarium. Some people have a tendency, okay, just dump it, you're done, right? Don't do that. Because the water in the bag came from the aquarium store, and it may not be as... Good, good at the water quality as you would like in your home aquarium. It could also have some parasites or other bacteria, things like that in the water. So the best thing to do is after you've acclimated the water, pull the bag out, net your fish out, put the fish in the tank, throw that water away. Now, I'm just kind of... Uh, finish this with some people will talk about taking some aquarium water and putting it into the bag of water. That sounds like a good idea because you're gonna be blending the water together, but here's what happens. If those fish have been in the bag for any period of, of time, you know, longer than maybe an hour or so, there's gonna be high ammonia, there's gonna be high carbon dioxide, there's gonna be low pH in that water. Now you're gonna take aquarium water, putting it in there, you're gonna raise the pH, the higher the pH, we talked about this on the uh, water quality lecture, the higher the pH, the more toxic ammonia becomes. So while the pH was low in the bag, the ammonia was at a in a non-toxic form of ammonium. As soon as you start raising that pH in the bag, that ammonia ammonium becomes ammonia, which is toxic. So now you're exposing your fish to toxic ammonia. So there's pros and cons to, to doing gradual water changes and um, you know, so there are some benefits, but in most practical cases, you just make sure the temperature is okay, the pH is okay, you can take the fish out and put them into your tank. And then after you put them in, we already mentioned, give them a little food, distracts everybody, and they all will live happily ever after. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Nick. This is really a great presentation. Um, 
So uh, again, thank you for your time. We actually had a question and it came from Art on Facebook and he, he did mention it's off topic. Uh, but he's curious about how dangerous rabbits are. Um, he's been told to add one to his 310 gallon fowler tank, but concerned about the venom. I don't know if you could maybe comment on that. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of those spiny fish that have venoms in them, you know, the, the bolisons, lionfish, uh, the rabbit fish, scorpion fish. And uh, I do know several people who have been stung through the bag or through a net in trying to catch those fish. And they usually get pretty sick. Uh, I know one that had to be hospitalized. Most of them do not end up in the hospital, though, but it's not pleasant. So you have to, art, and this is a good question, Art, and I appreciate it. You have to look at what your tank situation is. You know, are you going to be in and out of that tank on a regular basis? Is that something where you're going to be rearranging coral? Or is it a show tank that's done and you're going to add a fish in there and you're never going to have to touch that fish again for the rest of that fish's natural lifespan until it passes away and you take it out? Okay, so if you're not going to be messing with it and handling that fish, you're probably okay uh, taking the precautions of don't depend on a plastic bag to protect you. So if the you know if the fish is being shipped to you or you're picking it up somewhere, if it's going to be in a bag, but preferably if it's the bag is in a bucket or some kind of firm sided container, even a, a box that you're handling it, not in uh, a soft puncture puncturable bag. And then uh, because of the spines, be careful about netting. Rather than netting, in this case, it would probably be better to open the bag, pour it into some kind of plastic uh, container that's a manageable container, where then you could, you know, carefully get rid of some of the, the water that's in there and then pour it into your home aquarium again. So you're just not touching it. Uh, even using, you know, some kind of scoop or something to scoop it out and put it in, you'd have to be careful. I wouldn't recommend a net because if those barbs get trapped in the net, then you're going to rip up the fins or you know, rip up your netting and you could be very difficult extricating it from the netting material. Um, so that's the consideration. And that's true for any of these venomous fish. It's like, you know, they, they look great. They're really cool, uh, very interesting. Uh, but, you know, if you have kids at home or in a situation where you're going to be down in that aquarium on a, on a frequent basis, maybe not the best fish. But if it's in a tank where you don't have to mess with it, be a great display specimen. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Nick, and thank you all for joining us on this week's uh, Pink Talk. Again, we discussed producing ornamental, healthy ornamental fish. Um, definitely go check out the past streams um, that we've done on nutrition and water quality. We've got more uh, topics coming up in the coming weeks, so stay tuned. We'll have some more events coming up. Um, other than that, uh, I thank Dr. Nick for his time and expertise, uh, lending all that to us so we can all become better aquarists. And uh, thank you all for your time and joining us. I uh, hope everybody has a great rest of your week and um, we'll see you next time.